Well, welcome everybody. I'm glad to, to be with you. Good morning for those of you on the East Coast of the US. I'm actually joining you from Malta. I'm here uh, in the middle of the Mediterranean teaching in our dual degree program uh, in conflict resolution and Mediterranean security. So we are halfway through our afternoon here and just finished a, a good day of class. Um, welcome to uh, just one of the first couple events of Carter School Spring 2023 Peace Week. I'm, I'm Dr. Julie Rouge. I'm a faculty member at Carter School, as well as the associate dean, and um, looking at the the list of folks that are here, I know that some of you I have have met before and had a chance to meet, but there's quite a few um, folks on that I haven't had a chance to meet yet. So I look forward to to getting to hear from you as as the afternoon for me and the morning for many of you progresses. Um, so as many of you know, the Carter School um, does a, a Peace Week twice a year each semester where we try to bring together faculty, staff, students, alumni, and members of our community to talk about uh, emerging issues, um, questions that are arising, research, practice areas, and, and a variety of different topics suited for a variety of different kinds of audiences. Um, this session is geared to be for, um, uh, for people who are starting to emerge to think about how they wanna engage in conflict resolution practice and some of the different kinds of roles that they take. So I know for some, folks who've been a member of our community for a long time. Um, some of this may be familiar and I'll hope that you'll you'll help with some coaching and, and teaching and mentoring as we go. Um, the theme for this year's Peace Week is what works, building peace at home and in the world in challenging times. Um, and this session really fits into that as we think about what are the different kinds of roles that we can take as we deal with conflicts um, around us. And that's gonna be a, uh, the focus for today. Um, you probably have seen that we are recording the session. Uh, we do record Peace Week sessions and they are usually available over the next couple of weeks um, online as the um, uh, event staff, Amber Williams, particularly, who's really a fantastic uh, organizer of this event, um, has a chance to get them uploaded. So um, I'm really excited to be here with you and start this. This is gonna be an interactive session. I'm not gonna be talking for an hour and a half. We're gonna be doing um, some different activities together uh, uh, thinking about how we want to think about the different kinds of roles that we take. So um, do feel free to put questions in the chat or raise your hand as we go. I will be, uh, you all be working together some and, uh, and bringing some of that back. So we are going to be um, working through this together today. Um, any kind of questions on the logistics before I get started? Doing okay? Um, well, as I said, I'm I'm a faculty member at, at, at George Mason as well as being um, a twice alum. So I got my master's and my PhD from the Carter School in conflict analysis and resolution. And my research work for the PhD and, and kind of early on was really focused on um, the role of violent extremist groups and how they are connected to communities and, and what it looks like for um, us to talk about violence and how we create incentives in, in what we do. Uh, in terms of media coverage, as well as our conversation about violence for people to, to engage violently in, in conflict. But over the last probably decade or so, my work has shifted much more to looking at um, how do we work with uh, communities who are engaging with conflicts uh, in, their, in their daily lives and what they care about. So this has included um, projects that are working uh, with special education, for instance, and helping with processes it would bring facilitators in to help families and school systems who are having conflict over getting the, the needs and services of students who have special needs met. Um, it also has involved quite a few projects in the local Northern Virginia area, working with communities who are trying to make decisions about what to do with Confederate legacy items. So street names named after Confederate generals, um, monuments, markers, symbols, um, that if you're from the Northern Virginia area are kind of all around us. And it's taken some really intentional community conversations to help people decide what they want to do uh, that that um, what they want to do with those symbols that have been ingrained in in the communities for a long time uh, and obviously represent can have quite different meanings in their representation to different members of the community I've also worked on police community dialogue police reform projects um, a variety of different things but the the role really has been focused on my role has really been focused on thinking about how do we help communities and um, organizations, groups, do the hard conversations that they need to do well so that they're learning from each other, they're really engaging, they're making good decisions, uh, they're making decisions where people feel like they were informed and part of the process. And so 
just to have that kind of as my orientation that um, uh, that's that's the, the primary kind of role that I'm focused on is thinking about how do we tackle really difficult, ingrained, perpetual uh, conflicts in ways that really bring in multiple voices and allow for, for communities and, and people to make good decisions. So um, just to have a frame of where I'm starting from. So I wanted to actually start as we thought about these roles um, by starting by thinking about what are some of the different ways that we understand the conflicts that are happening around us. And, and um, you know, for those of us that do kind of conflict resolution practice as a, a, a daily job or in all that we do, which is, I think, many of you as well, you know, our first step is really to think about how do we understand the conflict that's happening? How do we understand um, what's going on in, in a way that helps us to then be able to identify our opportunities for intervention? Uh, and later on, we'll get to kind of the roles that we could take. And I wanted to sh share a framework that um, I think is useful. And, and for those who've had some conflict courses, you've hopefully seen this before. But uh, this framework is created by Myra Dugan. And, and she was a Carter School faculty member uh, a couple of decades ago. It has been in a lot of different places teaching conflict resolution. And one of the things that she encouraged us to think about was that we have conflict that happens at, at many different levels. Um, uh, in terms of the uh, where the actual conflict is existing. So, you know, that conflict may be existing at a very issue specific level. And, and these tend to be conflicts that are kind of disagreements over information or where we have divergent interests. Those issue specific conflicts uh, might be something that might be fairly easy to negotiate. It might be something that um, we can we can give a little and take a little. Um, but usually they're fairly concrete and have some boundaries to them that are that are fairly easy to understand. Um, and they kind of sit at the middle as maybe the, the narrowest or the, the smallest in scope of those conflicts. You can imagine these happening at, at, at a much larger level too, right? Issue specific conflicts that may be across you know, border issues or um, land rights or things like that at a, at a more macro level. But the idea is that there's this, in the center of the circle, there's kind of the very specific issues uh, that we might be addressing in the conflict. In that next circle out, we're thinking about relational issues. And so this is where the, the conflict is actually emerging, not from an issue specifically, though we may talk about an issue, but really from a broken relationship or a fractured or a strained relationship where um, potentially patterns of interaction have created um, a set of feelings and, and, and orientations towards the other party that mean that we're we're continuing to find other issues or, or create other issues to be in conflict about that if we maybe had stronger relationships, we wouldn't necessarily uh, have to address those as conflict issues. And so this is really kind of thinking about we have the issue specific, but we also know that some of our conflict is actually um, embedded at the relational level, whether those are interpersonal relationships, relations between nation states, relations between um, ethnic groups or, or other community organizations, things like that. Um, she talks about then going a little bit bigger, right? That then we have conflicts that might have their origination point um, at the subsystem level or the system level. And, and I'll start system level and go back in. At the system level, these are conflicts that actually are originating in the system itself. So, you know, many of our social systems have built in um, inequities. So whether it is class, education, race, gender, that is the source of that. But it's systems that have these um, like built-in inequities where people are not able to access the same the same kinds of goods or the same outcomes um, based on some of those built-in systems. And so she's arguing that some conflicts actually exist at that level, right? That the conflict is coming from the system level. Um, we may experience it as issues. We may experience it in our relationships, but that ultimately the source of the conflict is at this broader system level. And just in between those two, she identifies a subsystem level where we think about how those big picture inequities actually get turned into um, ways in which the systems in our daily lives work. So whether it's our workplaces, our homes, our communities, our churches, our um, educational institutions, right? So, so that these are all related. And the idea here is that these are these are four interrelated. This is a it's a nested model, as she called it, a nested theory, where the the four are related to each other. Issue specific conflicts are impacted by things that happen at the system level. The system constantly is um, being impacted by how, how responses to issue specific and relational conflict happen. 
But it's important piece of what we're we're up to is to recognize that while often the conflicts that were presented may be presented as a specific issue, right, between two people, between two countries, between two communities, they're existing in a much larger system and structure. Um, and so that's one of the things that we want to pay attention to as we're thinking about how do we map conflict. And um, conflict mapping is an inherently a doesn't have to be something that we do geographically. It's, it's something that we try to use tools to come up with a, a systematic analysis of what's happening in a conflict. The second just tool I'm gonna just share briefly, because um, I want you to be able to use these in just a minute is, is thinking about as we're looking at conflict, what are the, the parties in the issues that we're really dealing with in the conflict? So if we're trying to get a handle on what's going on in something that we see in front of us or in the community or in the world, Thinking about who are the parties, who's actually involved. Um, we have core conflict parties. So these are parties that are, are very central to the conflict, that are um, very close to it, that are immediately impacted by it. Uh, they're usually the obvious parties, right? You think of um, if it's a family conflict, right, between parents and children, it's going to be the parent and the child. Or if it's a community conflict, it might be between, um, uh, you know, one church member and another church member. Um, but usually those core conflict parties are fairly easy to identify, um, though sometimes a little bit harder to label and name, particularly if we're talking about groups. We're also interested, though, are, are there subgroups within those parties? Are they, um, are they completely consistent among them? Are there different constituencies? So are there members of that party that may fall on a different part of the spectrum around this particular conflict? Are there some um, uh, kind of internal um, divisions? Are there internal... Um, constituencies that may be interested in a different outcome than a, another another part of that party is. And so we're, we're paying attention to that as well. Along with that goes thinking about what are some of the secondary parties. So if I'm thinking about a family conflict that may be between a parent and a child, there's also additional parties outside of that, um, secondary parties who might include additional family members, right, or a teacher or a coach or someone else who might be might be a little bit outside the system, not directly involved, but clearly is impacting it. And we can think about the same thing for larger scale conflict. So if you think about a, a, a national conflict, so if we were to say the war in Ukraine right now, right? Core conflict parties might be Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus, but there's plenty of secondary parties uh, to this conflict at this point, um, including obviously, you know, the US, the EU, you know, others who, who are involved. And then we're, we care about what are the relationships between the parties? Um, how, is, how is their power lined up? And, um, for many of you who have political science backgrounds or other social science backgrounds may recognize that there's really a lot of different ways that we can define power, whether it's relational power, formal power, technical power, information power, uh, a lot of different ways that we may exhibit power, um, symbolic power uh, in the world. Um, but what's the relative role of power with the parties? And, and a lot of conflicts that we pay attention to, that power is not equal right? So people are not um, engaging in conflict from the same standpoint, from the same basis. So um, if it's a parent and a child, we usually understand the parent to have more power uh, in a lot of the formal ways, though sometimes children have other kinds of power uh, in those relationships. Um, we would talk about, I think most people would have previously talked about the war in Russia and Ukraine as being an asymmetrical conflict with Russia being the more powerful party. Uh, I'm not sure it's entirely played out in that way, though there's clearly some elements of why Russia would still be considered the more powerful party because of their access to weapons and um, political infrastructure. Um, so we're interested in what's those relationships between them. And then we're interested in who are the leaders of the parties and how do their goals match up with the membership. And so um, in a lot of the work that I did previously on you know, extremist groups and, and violence, one of the things that we found often was that the relationship of the um, I'm sorry, the interests, the goals of the leaders of the group may not always match up with the goals of the members of the group. Um, and you can imagine this also happening in kind of smaller community groups where you may have a leader, uh, a leader of a community, a leader of a town, a leader of a religious institution who might have a different set of goals than the members of those institutions. And so something for us to pay attention to. The second piece we're going to pay attention to <clears throat> today um, when we do intensive conflict mapping, you know, these can be pages and pages and pages long, sometimes books, books length as we try to map the conflict. But the other piece I want to pay attention to today is um, what are the conflict issues? What do the parties have as positions, interests, and needs? And in the conflict literature, we make this distinction between them that 
physicians are the thing that I'm going to come in and tell you that I care about, right? The stand I'm taking on this conflict. So whether it is um, the position I'm taking around a community issue, uh, a, con a Confederate street name, for instance, that my position might be that I want the name changed or I want the name to stay the same. That would be my position. Uh, and usually that's the first thing that people tell us in conflict is what their position is. And it, and it usually is tied to what they want the outcome to be, uh, that here's how I want this conflict to go. We're also interested though in, in what their interests are. What is it that's driving that position? Um, what, is, what is the underlying reason why the person has adopted that position? So um, an interest in the example I just gave might be to have an inclusive community. And so I want the street name changed because I want to have a community that I understand to be inclusive in which all different people would feel welcome. And so that might be my interest underlying that or my interest underlying not wanting to have it changed might be that I am very interested in, in preserving historical legacy. And I'm really concerned that if we change that street name, we're gonna lose some element of, of preservation of our history. So that's my interest, that's why I'm there. Um, the underlying, even underneath that though, a little bit is a need. Um, and what is it that 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 need might be? And so um, uh, the need might be a sense of, of, of fairness, inclusiveness, wanting to be open, uh, wanting to, to embrace diversity, or it might be one of wanting continuity, uh, wanting to not um, be overwhelmed by change to feel like there's some things that are the same. So we think about breaking down these kinds of positions into interests and needs. And when you think, go through a lot of conflict literature, there's a lot of different ways that we think that being able to break down and understand a conflict party's positions, interests, and needs um, gives us better leverage to understanding how to help work through that conflict. We're also interested in how the parties understand the conflict in front of them, how they understand the causes and the meanings of that conflict. Um, and what's important here is that, um, you know, we live in a little bit of an age of relativism where there's a tendency to, to be, uh, there's some pushback against the idea that maybe everyone's perceptions are, are equal. And I think that that's valid critique and pushback. But as someone who's doing conflict research or conflict resolution, in a lot of ways, I'm, I need to deal with the people that are in front of me as they understand the world. So I may understand that there are some, um, that they're, the position or the perceptive perception that they're changing may not be acknowledging something that I might assume to be objective facts, right? But the reality of it is that if I'm going to actually do effective conflict resolution with them, I need to, to understand and appreciate the perception that they have of the conflict. Um, even if I don't agree with it, right? Or even if I think that it may not be valid. I think one of the things that we've learned over the last five to 10 years um, is that there's been an effort to try to use just information as a way to change people's minds. And I think what that has left out is, is how powerful perceptions and beliefs are. And that just giving somebody new information is not necessarily um, always gonna change a position. And the last thing about conflict issues we're interested in is what's the current behavior of the parties? How are they? How are they in, intending to wage this conflict or trying to wage this conflict? Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second because what I actually wanna do um, is have us go into um, some smaller groups and take a couple minutes to um, talk about, I've got a, a Jamboard. I don't know if you all have ever used Jamboard before. Let me show it to you. Mm. I guess I do want us to do this more as a conversation than as me talking. Um, the idea of a Jamboard is that it is a, an opportunity for us to do some sharing like we would if we were all in a room together and we could actually be making some notes and, and writing things up. And what I've done is just created a framework that looks at um, that outer circle. So in this outer circle is where we can put conflicts that we think are coming, stemming from that systemic level. Um, and then we have the subsystem that relational level we talked about, and then the issue specific. And what I'd like you to do in your groups is identify two or three conflicts that you care about in the world um, and think about where you would put them. Where do you think you would actually put them on this schematic? Where do you think that those conflicts are stemming from? And then there's a little feature over here on the left um, that's called a sticky note, and you can create a sticky note and you can write your conflict on there and then write a little bit about what you think the positions and issues are for that conflict. And then once you hit save on this, you're gonna be able to position it on the, on the screen. So I'm gonna um, share in the chat the link to this Jamboard.
if I can manage to do multiple things at the same time, which I think I can. Um, what I'd like you to do is when you're in, I'm going to have you in groups of, it's uh, three or four, I think, um, but come up with two or three conflicts that your group uh, cares about, something in the world that really matters to you. It could be interpersonal, it could be something in the community, it could be something international. Um, you don't all have to agree on them, but just have a little bit of a discussion about where you think that conflict lies. Is it stemming from things at the structural level, the subsystem level, the issue specific uh, or relational level? And then create some post-its that actually have the name of the conflict um, and what you think some of the positions are, some of the parties are, and what some of the issues are. And go ahead and put it on that Jamboard so when we come back, we can um, uh, take a look at them all together. So, um, uh, I, I've gone ahead and created some groups. If anybody can't go into them, we'll keep one group here in the, the main room. But what we're going to do is take maybe 10 minutes um, in the groups to do that and then come back together. And then I'm interested to hear a little bit about some of the conflicts that you all identified. So um, does that, I know we have one person who says in the chat that they won't be able to participate because they're traveling, which is fine. Um, but does that make sense in terms of directions where we're heading? All right. Well, let me go ahead and open the rooms and you all will get a chance to, um, to uh, self-identify or to self-facilitate in your rooms um, what, you're, what you're up to. The link to the Jam board I've just put again in the chat um, and I can broadcast it out to all the rooms. If you have any trouble, I'll be in the main room and you can come back to me. So uh, see you in about 10 minutes. I'm interested to see what conflicts you identify that, that you all really care about. Okay, um, anybody want to talk a little bit about what they saw as the... Um, the issues and the parties involved in the conflict that you all talked about. Would anybody um, from room two, either Mari or Honore, do you want to talk anything about the conflict that you put up here? Okay, um, so let's try room three. Deanna, Mauricio, or Riley, do you want to say anything about the conflict that you added to the jam board? Well, I don't. Go for it, Mauricio. <laughs> sure, I don't want to. <laughs> I didn't want to speak for Riley. Uh, well, I want to thank Riley, who's a, a student at uh, GMU, apparently, who brought up uh, the subject of water and security in the dispute. And um, I think uh, their comment was that it's uh, you know relational between these two parties, these two uh, governments, um, where Ethiopia is trying to create a dam that is affecting, I suppose, the water resources of Egypt. Um, and in reflection, I had also suggested perhaps making this uh, a little bit bigger into a sort of systemic issue because uh, as a water uh, issue, it's happening probably all around the world and maybe even in other parts of the Nile River. So it's also related to a, a much larger system. And then Deanna, I think you you had a comment about it being specific. Yeah, I think in terms of the issue of water that's specific, but the relational is a big thing. And then it's systemic in, as or the larger system because uh, there's a power struggle there. I think that's really important what you all have identified is that for any element of this issue, it's gonna have it's gonna have pieces of all of them, right? So we may be identifying that in this instance, primarily this is a relational concern. There may be a specific issue about the water, but that it's kind of stemming from this relational distrust, but we have elements of the system or the systemic and the subsystem in there too. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that um, on that one. Um, Devin or Mohammed or Nancy, do you want to talk about one of the ones that you put up there and tell us a little bit about who you think the parties are and what their issues might be? Uh, I can try to about it. Perfect. Um, Thanks, Nancy. <laughs> uh, Congo and Rwanda, I, I thought it was uh, more of a, the issue specific, probably also relational. Uh, the party are obviously the Congolese uh, government and I guess the Rwanda government. Uh, starting from the end of the genocide, the Rwanda genocide with the invasion of a, a Rwanda leader into Congo to, you know, to wipe out the, the remaining people. Run the, run, run the refugee who went into Congo, but from that it, um, it became the, the conflict emerged becoming even bigger because then now the Rwanda wants their, that eastern part of the Congo because of also 
there is a resource issue, um, the mineral resources of Congo. So it's also economic, uh, the interest is also economic interest because of the resources there. So it's not only because they want to exterminate the remaining Hutu went in, into Congo, but also now it's a more of a natural resources situation. So they're fighting that eastern, the two provinces of Congo, the eastern part. So that's, that's why I say it's issue specific. Thanks, Nancy. And I, I mean, I think one of the things to pay attention to in that conflict is that you do have a much broader kind of natural resource question too, right? Which would be yeah. at probably the subsystem or system level about um, limitations on natural resources and limitations on on water and other things. So, so the issue may be specific, kind of in the moment about contention around this particular um, resource in this particular moment. But you, but we are also paying attention to that we know it exists in a much larger system. So, thank you. That, thanks for doing that overview for us, um, Emily or Lydia. Uh, and can you talk a little bit about the conflict you put up? Or you were interested in talking about? Okay, let me move to uh, Jeff, Maria, Teresa, or Sean. And I, um, what what conflict were you all interested in? What did you talk about? I, I can speak about that. It was me and Jeff. Hey, y'all. Um, uh, greetings from San Diego, where I'm about to lead a training. Um, so the way I like to think of this model, and good to see you, Julie, uh, is 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 like pulling a thread through the the different levels of the nest rather than just trying to plot it in one place. And so I I, I put uh, three little stickies here in that kind of upward diagonal to the right um, uh, around just like take any issue that might be discussed by politicians. So the specific issue might be something about. I don't know, you just name it, COVID, might be police reform, might be might be a specific incident, anything at all. But because of the relational dynamic being such that party uh, enemies are just that, they're your enemy, it prevents any sort of collaboration. And the subsystem that's controlling that is a, is a system of polarized party politics where the parties are in charge. Um, and, and so I kind of see, I can't help but look at you know, naming the system just as important as as naming why that that issue is not being solved. So I don't know if that made any sense, but that's how I thought about this. Thanks, Sean. Um, and I know that you've done a lot of thinking about this and how to use these different models and tools. So I appreciate you you chiming in on that. Um, okay, let me, um, Precious or Terrence, did you put a, a conflict up and you want to talk a little bit about what you identified? Let me go to uh, Ella, Kristen, or Renata. You want to talk about what you you all identify? Yes. Sorry, one second. Listening. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Ella. Okay. Um. So we were talking about the conflicts on campus, kind of how the community's reaction to gun gun perfect. Uh, sorry, Youngkin, um, speaking, and we're trying to like, because this is the situations right issue specific, but we're discussing the relational subsystem systems from the issue. So I'm probably gonna let Kristen hop in at some point, but um, so the main issue is the conflict going on right now. And we were saying that the interactions between parties is kind of more from a political base. There's been conflict in Virginia between the two parties, mainly over education, other things going on, CRT as a whole. And then um, we were talking about how <laughs> is um, inequities brought into our daily lives. And that's kind of like the divide between politics and how politics should be involved in education and education and politics back and forth. Um, we were having trouble identifying the system level and subsystem levels completely. But we are talking about how this is tied and kind of paired with the system level of how public education is really closely tied to politics and political funding. And that our issue kind of stems from wanting to maintain a good relationship with government in order to 
under a school, but that's kind of just a completely different conflict that we identified too. And we're like, that's just mm -hmm. kind of in passing with each other coming from a public university. But that's what we talked about. I think you, I think you addressed most of it, Ella. Um, we had discussed how the specific conflict between um, some members and groups in the student body and um, the university administration was was pretty issue specific at this point um, with those students feeling um, perhaps uh, betrayed by the selection of the governor as the speaker at their commencement. Um, but that we recognize that the university operates within um, you know, a multi-level system and that there are other influences at play uh, besides um, Washington's kind of specific decision to invite Yunkin to speak. So um, yeah, I think that's kind of where we left it. Thanks. And for those that um, don't necessarily have context on this one, this is that George Mason announced uh, Friday maybe that um, the governor of Virginia, uh, Governor Yunkin would be the commencement speaker for the May 2023 commencement. And he has been um, um, he is he is considered a controversial figure by by some, and it has raised concerns among some of the students about having him as the speaker. So just for those who aren't maybe uh, Mason based or Northern Virginia based, that's the the context for that um, that conflict. Thanks, thanks Ella, and thanks Kristen for filling that out for us. Um, Avery or Emily, can you talk a little bit about the conflict that you all chose? All right, I'm going to move to John and Joshua. Can you say anything about what you guys put up here? I can, I was in the group uh, too, oh, Julian. I know both, Thanks. both of them are driving. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Cause your name had dropped off. I thought you had been in that group and then I didn't see your name now. So yes, please. I got, that's okay, <laughs> I got disconnected, my internet connection. Um, so we, uh, we talked about uh, three things, access to voting, suicide in the schools and the pressure that's amounting. Uh, to why the kids are, are contemplating suicide. And then also just about the availability of foundational educational materials and how that's impacting, you know, uh, just creating a foundation for them in society in general. So those are the three things we talked about. Um, I just talked a little bit, uh, my topic was about the suicide in the schools and how this, the students are, so this was issue specific about the suicide, how the students weren't really getting access to resources to work through the trauma when something like that happened, and that a lot of them were contemplating suicide because of the pressure to be in AP classes or honors and extracurricular activities. So they don't have enough time, you know, because they just, you know, to sleep. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's creating like animosity even between the students. So there's a lot of slurs that they're having to, you know, deflect every day. Um, and so that was, you know, so it's an issue specific and a relational uh, discussion. I don't know if the other two want to talk about their, their two issues they brought up, but that was the one I, I mentioned. Well, and we'll let John and Joshua break in, but I also would say, Deborah, I think in your thinking about that there's larger structures and, and subsystems in place, right? The, the college admissions process and what we value in that process and, and all, you know, a lot of those different structures are kind of built into that broader sense of, of then what the individual students are, are working with in their day-to-day, -day, right? Yes, they, they did talk about that as well. Yeah. And how overwhelming that can be and the support that they need. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, John or Joshua, did you want to? Go ahead. Yep, yeah, can I just chime in quickly? It's, it, it, yeah, John, but uh, I kind of want to associate myself with those three small stickies going out because the, the issues that, that that we were talking about, or at least that I was discussing, kind of those foundational issues of, of access to voting, access to health care, access to education, you know, depending upon which group you're in, they're very specific to you if you're the impacted party. Uh, they're also you know, on a, on a subsystem basis, important to the to the broader society. So I think it's that kind of that linear progression out in those, uh, you know, their individual groups, but they all kind of come back to that equality issue. Yeah, thanks for that. I think you know that's one of the kind of foundational pieces as we think about trying to do 
these mappings is that, you know, Sean kind of put those stickies up in this, this kind of not uh, linear, but in the sequential way. And, and that we're really trying to pay attention to that, that often the issue that's presented in front of us is a very small piece of much larger systems, structures, relationships, and that we can get caught in the trap of thinking we're just dealing with the issue in front of us. But if we're not actually dealing with any of the relationships, the, system, the, the larger systems or the subsystems, we only have so much space that we can move in to actually try to deal with the issue as it presents itself. So I, I think that that's, this is a really important piece of this and a really important piece of this model is thinking about that um, while I asked you to put it in one place, right? To take a sticky and put it one place, it it's really one place amongst the four that impact every single one of these issues. And so I think for for all of you, I think you've kind of identified that in the different conflicts you're you're dealing with that certainly shows up. Um, I'm going to stop sharing and make sure. Did we um, catch any? Did is there anybody who I may have gone past, but wants to come back and talk about the conflict that they put up on the board? All right. Well, let me come back to. Um, uh, I wanted to move kind of where where I was heading next, which is to actually think about some of the different roles that we might play in conflict. And, you know, this has been um, an evolving conversation, I think, over the years about what are the, the right roles, what are the different sets of roles. And, and maybe let me set this up a little bit to say that, you know, a lot of the work that I've done in the last 10 years um, that has been about being a facilitator or doing facilitated processes has been uh, the opening, the creation, the ability to take that role has been created because there was people in other kinds of roles. So there was activists, there was advocates, um, there was people in the street after George Floyd was, was murdered, right? Demanding change uh, and putting pressure on local governments and elected officials for that change. And that then led to them wanting to set up sets of processes that would try to deal with police reform or uh, Confederate monuments and markers, things like that. And so I, none of these roles are, are better or different, you know, than the others. These are all just, they're different kinds of roles that we might take in dealing with conflict. And I pulled together, and these are from um, both some from William Urey, but also Chris Mitchell over the years have written about this. And, and then pulled from my own experience, what I thought were the ones that were really at the, the front of what we're doing right now. And they're not necessarily new roles, but I think they've been emerging as in, increasingly important and not always the first roles we think about, um, some of them are, but not always the first roles we think about in engaging with conflict. And, and I'm interested as we kind of move forward with this with some of you who've got um, a lot of experience working in conflict, kind of where you see some of these emerging roles uh, playing, playing the most importance are. Um, I think, um, let me just kind of, I'll walk through these and then uh, we, can, we can go where I wanna go next with this. But, but the first one, and this has been a role that I think has emerged um, has always been there, but I think it's a role that has been showing up more intentionally or more um, visibly recently. And that's really this role of teacher or coach. Um, and there's a there's a the idea of how do we really help people have the skills to handle conflict themselves? What are we bringing to them? And so there's a there's a field of conflict coaching. You know, we now have a conflict coaching class. I know there's a variety of places that are trying to teach this. But it's been an informal role for a very long time. Uh, and I think, you know, lots of you do this when you're doing mentoring or you're working with someone or that friend comes over and says, what am I going to do? I've ended up in this bad situation. How do we help? But I think we're increasingly paying attention to this as a really important role that we can play as conflict resolution practitioners or, or that other people are playing in these conflict situations is thinking about what's our role as teacher or coach? How do we help people have the skills to to manage conflict themselves. So it, it takes away the um, the pressure to have somebody from the outside helping, right? If we have people uh, more engaged and able to handle their own conflicts. The second one up here is bridge builder. So how do we forge relationships across lines of difference? Um, and, and, and whatever those lines of difference are. So um, Sean and I actually were at a conference a couple of weeks ago that was around thinking about how does technology create lines of difference? Um, and what are some different ways that technology could be used differently to what they were calling bridging conversations? How do we how do we create conversational spaces where people from both sides of political issues may have the opportunity to engage with each other versus at each other or against each other or only in their own 
um, conversational space. And so historically, you know, for the last 50 years, people have been doing things like this with exchange programs or bringing together youth from multiple sides of a conflict or bringing together religious leaders from multiple sides of a conflict. But I think there's an increasing interest and need for thinking about how do we build bridges in our in our electronic spaces, in our social media spaces, in our tech spaces. Um, and we'll have a chance to talk about that here in a minute. Mediator is still a really important role. It's been one that's around for a long time. Um, there's, a, there's a capital M mediation, which is the very formal thing that you might get as part of a legal process or part of a, a formal kind of uh, dispute resolution process. But there's lots of informal mediation roles that, that people take. So whether it's um, you know, working with members of the communities, there's many, many traditions that have long histories of having people who are elders or who are knowledgeable members of the community who serve as mediators. And, and the key thing about mediators is that the mediator is not deciding. The parties themselves are deciding and what the mediator is doing is helping facilitate the conversation to allow the parties to come to a decision that they then own and, and work through and, and are responsible for. So it's it's still it's it's a really important role. I think it's one that um, has increasing formality in a lot of different political um, and organizational systems, uh, but it's and it has an, a, a lot of power in informal role. This facilitator role, which I have the next one on here, you know, this is this is the role that I've been in for the last I don't know ten years or so. Um, but thinking about how do we use bringing people together in processes where they're able to really engage with each other uh, in structured ways. So it's not just putting people in the room and hoping that magic happens, um, which you know sometimes it does, but usually it doesn't. It's really structured thinking about how do we bring people into spaces where they're together, they're having an opportunity to, in, in ways that um, can create some, some safety or ways that allow for people to exchange and be vulnerable and and um, bring forward ideas. Uh, it also gives a chance to think through how do we move through decision processes and help groups and communities move through decisions. So I've been thinking a lot about this and I think um, facilitator roles have been around for a long time. Uh, I think we're increasingly aware that some of the tough conversations we're trying to deal with as communities, we're not equipped to just handle and that we need to have some structure around uh, those conversational spaces. So, so that one's there. Um, the next one I have on here again is one that's been around a long time, still very important though, an arbiter. And uh, this is someone who's determining, right? They're actually making the decision. They may be hearing out lots of cases. They may be hearing out both sides, getting lots of details, lots of information, but fundamentally they're the one deciding and that's a, a different role. So sometimes you hear mediation, arbitration kind of lumped together in one sentence, but they're, they're really quite distinct roles in that the mediator is not the decider. The mediator is facilitating a decision by the parties, whereas an arbiter is definitely functioning in that decider role. Um, the convener, and this is one that Chris Mitchell talks a lot about in his international work, is the power of being a convener, the power of bringing people together um, and providing the venue and the opportunity for people to be in the same space. And so there's there's online spaces, right? We've all been through a couple of years of having most of our convening happen online, but there's also convening that happens in person and the, the power of a group or an organization um, to bring folks together. So, you know, I, I've, I've um, been in lots of different conversations in the last couple of years about who's the right person to convene a conversation. And I think sometimes as a university or representative of a university, I can convene and host a conversation that another kind of um, someone placed differently from a different kind of organization couldn't do uh, because it is an academic institution. Same thing happens when churches sometimes host or convene, religious institutions host and convene, or I've also seen it happen where we have um, NGOs. I was doing a police community dialogue, and it was really, really important that the local food pantry was the convening authority for that dialogue because the community that we were working in trusted them and they trusted that if they were convening this conversation with the police, that it would be a, a safe place for them to go. So that convening authority is super important in terms of um, who's doing it, what kinds of conversations they're convening. They may not then run the conversation, but they're, they're providing legitimacy for the conversation. I think we've increasingly been looking at the role of healer and reconciler. How are we fixing broken relationships? Um, how do we deal with trauma that may have occurred 
during the course of the conflict or during the course of the, the break in the relationship. Um, there's a lot of really important work on how do we um, how do we manage in, 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 in trauma-informed ways, but in ways that are really thinking about needing, that along with dealing with conflict issues, we need to be really working on healing of both individuals and groups um, and thinking about reconciliation processes. So, so even in some of the processes I've done, you know, we may get to what everyone feels like is a very good ending point or recommendation, but there's still a need for someone to work with a community that has spent the last five years being fractured over a community issue or 10 years or 20, depending on what conflict you're talking about, working through the reconciliation and healing process. We don't always think of it as a conflict resolution role, but it's really important, I think, for the long-term success of those processes. Also been paying more attention to the role of witness and thinking about how witnesses impact us. And so, you know, a witness, if we think about, um, you know, witnesses and court trials, right, who are there to provide testimony or evidence. Um, but witnesses do a couple other important things. So, you know, we have a whole set of organizations that work at the international level whose job is to witness. So Human Rights Watch or some of the other organizations that, that, are, that are taking the job of doing the witnessing of what's happening in conflict, the different monitoring missions that happen at the, the UN or others. Um, we do this also, I think, you know, in local communities where you have uh, both media, but also community groups who are in the communities witnessing what's happening. And th there's two pieces of that. One is the after the fact, having someone be able to witness um, and say what's happened and provide some accountability. But there's also the in the moment assumption that, um, an, an assumption, and I think in many cases it's true, that being observed and knowing someone usually with some kind of power is observing you may change the behavior of the conflict parties. So knowing that there may be accountability, that what you do may be visible to all, um, can change the behavior. And we, we hope that it may change the behavior of people who might otherwise be engaging in violence or, or other things. It's not perfect by any means. Certainly there's witnesses of, of all sorts of uh, atrocity, but, but the idea that having some level of witness may help. Um, and then this last one on here is, I think, a very familiar one, a peacekeeper, the idea that we're in some way putting people between uh, parties or between uh, violent situations to provide protection and security. Um, there's a lot of complicated conversations around this, you know, peacekeeping roles over the last 70 or 80 years, but it is a role that we see happening both locally and, and internationally. So you see, you know, citizen patrols um, that, are, that are in community streets that are intended to kind of keep the peace by having their presence be there, by putting themselves between uh, and, um, and then as well as peacekeepers at the international level. And so I, I think there's um, some interesting elements to that role that I think continues to evolve uh, as we're continuing to evolve our uh, you know, understanding of, of what, what peacekeeping could mean. Let me open it up and see. Um, I, I mean, I've pulled from a couple of different places some of the roles that I've been paying a lot of attention to. Are there others that, that we should add to this that I've missed? Okay. Well, give me just one second. What I actually want to do um, is I want to break into smaller groups. I'm going to take just six of these roles. I'm going to take teacher, coach, bridge builder, facilitator, convener, um, uh, healer, and witness, because those I think are the ones that we have historically spent less time on. Um, and I want to have yeah, Sean, absolutely. Peace builder, I think, can be an overarching term that a lot of these different roles could fall underneath and they could be elements of peace building, absolutely, um, at the same time. So let me do this. I've broken this up into six groups and the six groups are looking at um, teacher, coach, bridge builder, uh, facilitator, convener, healer, and reconciler. And what I'd like you to do is, I'm gonna just put you in the groups for like 10 minutes just thinking about some of the conflicts that we've talked about, how do you think this role might play out? How do you see who, who might be able to play that role? Um, what role could they take? How, what, what do you think the openings are for some of the conflicts we talked about? So um, I'll stop sharing for a minute, but in our, in our jam board, we've talked about you know, South Sudan, uh, police training, the Israel-Palestine conflict, water insecurity, um, access, you know, issues in schools, access to voting, um, pressure in schools, Congo, Rwanda, Afghanistan, and I think 
you all kind of talked about several others as we went through it. Um, how do you see this role playing out? What are some of the, the pros and cons? What are some of the ways this role might be really helpful? What would be some things you're worried about? Um, and I'm gonna just open this up for us to spend just about 10 minutes um, thinking about that role and how you think it might be used. Um, and let me do quick. And then we'll we'll come back and I'm curious to see whether you, how, what you think of that role and if it's one that's gonna be um, one that's gonna be really useful for us moving forward. So let me um, make one quick change real quick. And then I'm gonna just open up these groups and I'll see you all in a couple minutes. All right, welcome back. I'll give you a second to settle from your being zipped through the time-space continuum back to uh, the room together. <laughs> it's always, I appreciate that about Zoom though, as a facilitator trying to get a group of people all back together after breakouts is a lot more difficult than when I can press a magic button and it just goes away and you have to be back with me. So um, let me uh, just, I'm curious what y'all talked about. What did you think? So let me actually start with um, the witness group, which I think was Mauricio and, and TM Cummings. What did you all talk about? How did you see the role of witness playing out? What conflicts? What was what was some of the thoughts you had? Um, I can just jump Perfect. on in, Mauricio. Yeah. Please um, add on. I guess from for, well, for one, I joined rather rather late, uh, okay. and so I, I missed a lot of the presentation. So Mauricio was very kind enough to to update me. Um, but essentially, we're just talking about the different. Um, the perspective of how the role of the witness can play not only um, in, in grounding the truth of the experiences done and carried out um, from, from a conflict, um, but they can also play a larger role in the peace process. And unfortunately, at times, you know, their, their perspective, and especially the, uh, when interventions are being placed, um, that has been uh, brainstorm or brought about from like, you know, thinking about like from the government and just implemented down, um, they may not be successful and there's different factors to take in like culture or whatever, what have you. And so it's important that, you know, witnesses that also take part in like civil society or what have you, that they are, their, their perspectives and, and they are taking, taking into consideration when um, going about peace. Thanks. Yeah, Marisa, I love, if you had others. Yeah, I love the phrase grounding the truth about what's happening in a conflict. I, that's a really powerful phrase. Mauricio, did you want to add anything? Yeah, um, thank you, Tiffany. I think we, and we expanded just again by, I'm not sure if you already just said this, uh, by stating how some of these roles overlap um, mm -hmm. quite a bit. And depending on the you know region or the conflict itself, um, you know, witness can, uh, and should often be more than just a witness. They can play a valuable role in the actual um, coming to the table and in re resolving the conflict, either as a healer, reconciler, even maybe even a facilitator to some extent, depending on the, because we're saying how, you know, it's important to be aware of um, in doing no harm, how larger agencies or groups can sometimes come in to bring peace and resolve conflict, but they often can ignore the very people that were, you know, part of the conflict itself, they may have actually valuable um, cultural resources to decide how that conflict might be resolved in their, you know, perhaps based on their culture and their background, and instead of, um, you know, only leaving it to the outside players. Um, so, so witnesses in many of these roles can easily overlap uh, when it comes to conflicts. Thanks, and thanks for reminding us of that, because I, I, I think that that's a really important point. These are not necessarily discrete roles, so sometimes they should be, right? There's some roles that just wouldn't match with taking on another role. Um, so, you know, if someone is is um, uh, is working as an arbit arbiter, right, it's hard to then actually be some of these other roles because you're in a decision-making seat. So it's hard for you to be sitting in a role where um, people don't see you that way. So, so yes, there's a whole lot of these roles that could overlap, and we have to be thoughtful about which ones shouldn't or couldn't uh, overlap. Um, though I think, you know, that's been one of the struggles that that I think peace building has had for the last 15, 20 years is we've been asking people to take on a variety of different roles. For instance, the military to do a lot of peace building roles that that are just incompatible with some of their 
functional military missions, whether they want to try to do it or not, right? So um, I think that that's an important point about being very mindful as reflective practitioners of what roles combine and which which should not. Um, let me go to the healer reconciler group. I think Diana, Mari, Renata, uh, anybody want to speak to what you all talked about, about a healer or reconciler? Sure, I can. Um, we, we, I talked about it in terms of restorative justice because that's the lens that I wear. And actually <clears throat> the uh, healer reconciler then um, the is is the participants of the circle, <laughs> you know. And so RJ, the facilitator, then is just there to hold the space to ensure that there is healing and reconciliation. Um, but it really is the role of the participants. Yeah, to do the work. And actually, John had put in the chat before we all broke out as a role is being a willing participant, one who's willing and able to come to the table as, as an important role. And, and as you said, in the processes that you're talking about, every participant is playing this role. It's not one magic role that's coming from an outside person, but everybody's playing that role. Thanks. Did anybody else from your group want to want to chime in? I think that was a great summary. Um, yeah, I also, uh, you know, making space for someone if you are um, a healer. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I think that's so crucial for, you know, moving on from a trauma or from something that that's impacted an individual, just being there, you know, validating their experience or their the situation that they had to go through. Um, yeah, and the rest was a good summary. Great, thank you all. I um, appreciate you talking about that for us. So let's move to the convener role. And this was um, Avery, I think Mohammed, Nadine, Nancy, anybody wanna talk about this, the convener role? Yeah, in the convener role, I will talk about the uh, Afghan conflict between the ruling group and the opposition. Actually, there is no talks and negotiation currently that's uh, off the uh, the way. And um, the, there was uh, some uh, uh, try to have Taliban to talk to the opposition, but they uh, didn't accept that after they uh, captured Kabul in August, 2021. But the best uh, convener will be uh, OIC, uh, Organization of Islamic Countries, they tried, but that was not successful. Um, uh, now the best convener, convener could be a delegation of religious scholar from different religious institution of Muslim countries to go and uh, at least try to open uh, or convince them to uh, come to talks to the opposition. That's uh, that's the one of the options. There there is a kind of international community uh, could play also a convening role, but uh, um, this is connected to the policy of international community in regard to the region, because uh, uh, there is also, as I put it. Uh, earlier in the uh, mapping, uh, additional to the specific uh, issue, issue specific uh, conflict, there is also a structured conflict and system because of the natural resources in Afghanistan with the, the uh, regional uh, economic power as China and Russia and others, they are interested to, to to continue with the ruling group, not uh, with the opposition or an inclusive government. Thanks, Mohammed. You know, that, that's really important, right? That if you, if you haven't done the mapping and you don't understand the players, it's really hard to identify who could be a convener. And you may have someone trying to play a convening role that is just not going to be accepted, right? Or their people aren't going to come. So you may think that you're playing a convening role, but based on where you stand in the conflict dynamics, your relationship with the parties, 
that, that people aren't going to trust you that this is a, a safe conversation to come to, or it's a legitimate conversation. I think that's a really important part that we have to have done the mapping, right, to really understand who the party are, who the parties are, to then understand um, who can who can play that kind of role. Um, Nancy or anybody else from that group, did you want to weigh in? Um, so then we also talk about the, the, the Congo, Congo and Rwanda conflict, but like you just say, uh, it's hard if you haven't mapped the conflict, but in yeah. this one, actually, the conflict is well mapped. We know what's going on, we know who the parties are, but I don't think there's been any uh, successful convener in this conflict yet because yeah. the tensions are always like high and even now they've been higher again, but I know uh, there have been some witnesses like the UN, the MONUSCO, they, they come, they they do more of a being a witness than convene and help the conflict. So, and recently we had um, President Macron was there, but, and all the um, treaties or the agreements, some of them, they've done, at least one party doesn't respect the other. So there hasn't been any successful convener yet. So. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that's really important. And it's sometimes it's easier to think about at the local level or the, the family level who can convene. At the international level, convening gets really complicated about who can play in those roles. Let me move to um, facilitator role, Honore, Precious, or Terrence. I wasn't sure if that group actually had a chance to meet. Um, so let me go to um, Bridge Builder. And uh, this is Deborah, Joshua, Riley, Sean. Who wants to talk a little bit about what you talked about? Uh, well, I guess I'll speak up here. Um, <laughs> or Deborah, go ahead. No, I mean, your experiences were great. So I'd love for you to share that because you had hands-on experience in this topic. <laughs> well, I'll just uh, briefly, I'll mention that, that, you know, bridge building um, kind of specific to the metaphor, if you think about different islands of, of, of stakeholders often at odds with each other, you know, the process, the act of bridge building is really making the connection between the two or three or 10 or whatever. Um, and yet the, and, and, and I reflected on how the, the field of bridge building was something that wasn't even really defined you know 20 years ago and, and now it's exploded there's the bridge alliance you know there's what like 30 organizations or i can't keep track of it um ostensibly all working toward you know building bridges between you know opposing sides or perspectives um but the challenge it's interesting the challenge is one that's that's also inherent in a lot of these other roles which is kind of staying in your lane or, 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 you know, collaborating well with other roles and, and folks in bridge building, I think, want to do it all. They want to do the, the making the connection, the convening, the facilitating, the, you know, the actual collaborative problem solving, um, because that's ultimately the goal at the end of the day is, is peace and reconciliation and whatnot. But so we, we talked about how, uh, um, you know, fundamentally, this is, uh, this is, uh, necessary. It's like a prerequisite to convening, uh, but sometimes it goes into beyond that. And and in some cases, it's easy. It's like, oh, sure, everyone is going to show up. In other cases, the entire process is just once you connect a bridge, then everything's easy after that. But it's really hard to do that, you know. And I, I mentioned working with Israelis and Palestinians for for about ten years, and how uh, you know once we have them together, it was actually relatively easy. But the process of building the trust to come to the table was the hardest part. Thanks, and I, and I think, Sean, I'm glad you highlighted that some of these things might need to happen in sequence, right? And that um, some of them are directly, some of these roles are directly working on the conflict in front of us, and some of them are working in other ways to figure out how do we change the dynamics? How do we build trust? How do we, so, so if you're doing a bridge building activity, you may never bring up the actual conflict issue because what you're working on is trying to build trust and relationship. And that's a precursor then for some other things. There's another role that we sometimes talk about, which is um, kind of a, 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 a an insurer. I mean, that or that kind of teacher role that prepares people before they can even engage in the conflict productively. So I'm appreciative. Thank you for bringing that that kind of sequencing question um, up for us. 
Um, Deborah, did you want to add anything to that? Or anybody else from that um, group? Yeah, the one question I the one question I did have is who prepares, just as you mentioned, like who prepares the groups? And then the other question was, how far does the bridge building go? You know, once once there's an agreement or there's some kind of connection, who 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 continues the process to keep it going? So we had that discussion. But one other thing that Sean had mentioned that I thought was really important was the uh, to really uh, be aware of who you're connecting with and how they fit into the bigger system and who they're connected to and are they connected to the decision makers and the politics behind that because all that strategy is very helpful when you're you're trying to determine you know who who to connect with and how to do it in in the timing and everything of that. I know it's not that easy because there's a lot more that come into play, but it was just something to you know to think about. Thanks. Well, let me uh, make sure we pick up our, our final group, which is the teacher coach. We had Emily, Emily, and John. So do you want to talk a little bit about what you talked about? Yeah, so uh, John and I, and, and and I think Emily was having issues with, with her microphone, but we essentially mentioned and discussed that the teacher and coach can be many different people um that you brought up you know it can it can be the witness it can be the peacekeeper it can be the mediator um, but essentially as a teacher and a coach it's the person who kind of sets the room between the two well two or several parties and in that kind of gets people on a level ground so that communication can start so we can get to a, a problem solving approach rather than just being at odds. Um, and John had a really good story. I don't know if he's able to share. I know he's driving. Um, but in my um, experience was with the Afghan re refugee situation. Um, I am part of the DOD. And, you know, I, sitting in a room of very smart people, had to kind of be the teacher because of my interest in conflict resolution to say like, yes, we need to work with Department of State. We need to accomplish this one goal. And we're essentially saying the same thing, but this is the way to approach the problem because they only see, you know, the typical hammer of the DOD. And in this case, we were not trying to be the hammer, rather the facilitator and, um, getting Afghan refugees through to America or wherever they ended up. Um, and that was a huge, like, I remember the sigh of relief in the room from everybody. Like, I get it. I understand now. But without that, there it, it was just this beating the heads into the wall, trying to say the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, the, the teacher can truly be anyone but it is definitely a critical role um, in getting people on the same page to do the work that matters is crucial. Thanks, and I really appreciate that that framing that, and John, I'll get right to the, the framing that sometimes it's not just the conflict parties, but the people that are trying to assist that need the coaching and teaching Absolutely. as well, right? That they're not necessarily prepared to know how to handle trying to address the conflict from outside as helpers. So, John, what would you throw into that mix? Yeah, I think it was a great summation of our conversation. I think the one the one thing that I, that I, that I found helpful is that really the coach is the person who really opens the mind and lets, lets the possible in so that people can, in establishing that tone, be in a place that they can can start to give and take and let the process move forward. If you walk into the room with no understanding or expectation, the argument just continues without the ability to, 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 to listen. Thanks. Yeah, and I think that, you know, a really good coach is really good at asking questions and opening space as opposed to being someone who's coming with the answers, right? And that's um, a really important piece that I think you highlighted. Well, we have come to the end of our time, a couple minutes over. I'm sorry, actually, about that. Um, appreciative that we have it. Sean's in San Diego. I'm in Malta. So we have at least a 10-hour time time spread between us, uh, maybe more than that, depending on where everybody else is in the world. I um, appreciate you, you, know, you joining the session to, to think about this um, and kind of where we're going and where we're heading. I think 
Um, it continues to be an evolving conversation about what role we can play in conflict. Um, Sean's put his email in the chat. I'm going to put mine up there. I'm happy to chat. I will um, send the slides. It's only four of them, but I'll have uh, ask Amber if she can send them out to everybody who had registered so that you have those as a reference. Um, if you're interested, I think on Wednesday, a little bit later in the day, I'm doing a session that's, that's specifically talking about some of the community conflict resolution processes I've been working on for the last, I don't know, you know, five, 10 years, um, particularly in Northern Virginia around police reform, Confederate legacy, some of that. So if that's something of interest, um, that session is Wednesday, 6.30 here, so I think 12, 12 o'clock there, um, 12.30 uh, Eastern time, something like that. But um, happy to be connected. I see Emily, anybody else feel free to put put email addresses in the chat if you're interested in being connected. And I look forward to getting a chance to work with many of you in the future. Thanks for, thanks for coming out and enjoy the rest of Peace Week.